Hi, my name is Todd Whitehead, and I'm a postdoc at the University of California, Berkeley School of Public Health. And I work in the Center for Integrative Research on Childhood Leukemia and the Environment. Uh, in this brief presentation, I'd like to talk about the lasting legacy of chemical use in consumer products and construction materials. Um, chemicals can be found in dust, and children are exposed to chemicals that are trapped deep in carpets and on uh, household uh, surfaces. And you can see in the slide here, I have sort of a representation of, of how that looks in real life. We have a really plush carpet, and deep down in that carpet, there's uh, all this dust that's, that's kind of buried in there. And in that dust, there's uh, a lot of persistent chemicals. Now, in our study, we've collected dust from over 500 California homes, and we've measured various persistent chemicals in those dust samples. Uh, since we're interested in how chemical levels change over time and how persistent chemicals are in homes, we've done two samples of dust in some of those homes. Now, chemicals, chemicals that are persistent tend to accumulate uh, on dust particles, so that dust uh, that's trapped deep within carpets acts as a reservoir for these persistent chemicals. And when we try to do our typical household cleaning with vacuum cleaners or brooms, we have a, a lot of trouble really getting rid of and eliminating all of the dust in our homes. In fact, one study found that when you try to do typical vacuum cleaning, you get basically 10% of the total dust that's embedded in your carpet uh, out of your carpet. So the 10% of surface dust that's in your carpet, you're able to remove that with a typical vacuum cleaner. But the 90% of deep embedded dust that's down in the bottom of your carpet, you really can't get that out of there. And that's kind of a troubling thought. And that's the reason that uh, dust is able to accumulate these persistent chemicals over time. Um, now, conditions inside a home tend to extend the life of persistent chemicals. So things like direct sunlight, moisture, um, extreme temperatures, microbial activity that tend to degrade persistent chemicals, none of those things are really present inside a home. So it's, it's really a perfect, um, it's a perfect place for persistent chemicals to, um, to, to, to extend their lifetimes, basically. Um, so as I said, we're interested in sort of trying to assess how long a chemical might be able to remain in a house over time. And a, a perfect case chemical in, to study is por polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs. Uh, so PCBs were, have been used extensively since World War II, uh, and they were used for industrial uses uh, in things like uh, heat transfer, um, hydraulic equipment, um, in capacitors and, and large transformers at power plants. But they're also used in consumer products like uh, refrigerators, televisions, air conditioning units, um, and they were also used in construction materials, things like uh, paint, uh, roofing materials, ceiling tiles, caulk. Um, so PCBs have been banned since 1979. Uh, the distribution and, and manufacture of, of PCBs in the U.S. was banned in 1979. Um, but they're extremely persistent, so they're still around in the environment today. Um, so in our study, we, we tried to assess exactly how persistent PCBs were in, in our study homes. Uh, and we found that even after 30 years of regulation, um, PCBs were still detected in 99% of the study homes. Um, and we compared the levels uh, from two different dust sampling rounds that were separated by anywhere from three to eight years. And we expected that since uh, there were no new sources of PCBs entering these homes, we were expecting that the concentrations of PCBs or levels of PCBs would decrease over time. And we did see that, but in fact, we saw that in most homes, the decrease in PCB levels that was experienced was, was relatively modest, um, something on the order of like 25%. Uh, and you can see in the plot here, I'm showing uh, PCB 153 concentrations from the two sampling rounds. So on the left is sampling round number one, which we did from 2001 to 2007, and on the right, is sampling round number two, which was collected from in 2010. Uh, and you can see, essentially, that there is a decrease from round one to round two, as we expected, but that the decrease is, is not very um, substantial. And that just sort of indicates that, again, even though there's no new sources of PCBs in these homes, the PCBs are being cleared from the homes very, very slowly. And in fact, we can estimate the PCB half-life, which is essentially the amount of time it takes to go from the initial level of PCBs to half that level, for example, from, say, 10 nanograms of a PCB to 5 nanograms of PCB, we can estimate what that half-life is. And we, we found that for one PCB, it was as long as 18 years. 
So, so what are the implications of these findings? Well, essentially, persistent chemicals are going to remain in a home for a very long time. And that's things like PCBs, but it could also be other chemicals. Um, so what we're trying to do is develop strategies to reduce levels of persistent chemicals in contaminated homes. And one strategy that we're employing is uh, professional cleaning, where we try to go in and do really do a thorough cleaning and get rid of as much dust as possible with the hopes that we'll be able to reduce chemical levels in homes and also reduce children's exposure to these chemicals. Um, but perhaps a better idea would be to eliminate the use of chemicals in consumer products and in construction materials uh, in the first place. So you can kind of avoid having the problem in the first place. Um, and there's sort of the generations of chemicals. So you can see in the plot here that here's an a example of a PCB, PCB 209. And again, these were banned in 1979. And then when PCBs went out of style, soon after, PBDs became more prominent. So here's a picture of a PBD, PBD 209. Um, and you can see that it pretty much looks exactly the same as the PCB, except instead of having chlorines around it, it has bromines, and there's an ether bridge. Um, so PBDs were banned. BD-209 was banned at the end of this year. It was phased out in the US at the end of this year. And starting in 2014, uh, we're not going to use uh, BD-209 as a flame retardant anymore. But now we have this other chemical that's still in use, which is DBDPE. Um, and you can see that, again, it looks very similar to the PBDs, and it looks very similar to the PCBs. So we've gotten rid of, rid of one, and then the next, and now we're still using the other. And we can see still that PCBs are in our homes, even though they've been banned for 30 years. How long will PBDs be in our homes? And then how long will we continue to use these other chemicals that look very similar? And then how long will those chemicals be in our homes? So there's sort of this chain of replacement products that we need to uh, eventually sort of put an end to. Um, so again, the, the question is, what is the lasting legacy of these chemicals that we're using in consumer products and in construction materials um, in our homes and for our children? Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my funding agencies, which are the NIEHS, the EPA, and the NCI. I'd also like to acknowledge my collaborators at the California Childhood Leukemia Study and my collaborators at the California Department of Toxic Substances Control. Those are the scientists that helped us with the PCB measurements uh, that I talked about during this presentation. So specifically, I'd like to acknowledge Mirto Petraeus, Jun Su Park, Reber Brown, and Joginder Dhaliwal. Uh, and I'd also like to thank my collaborators at the California Department of Public Health. And I'd like to thank you for listening.